Pediatric Cardiology Today. My name is Dr. Robert Pass, and I'm the host of this podcast. I am professor of pediatrics at the Icon School of Medicine here in New York. Thank you very much for joining me for this 292nd episode of the podcast. I hope everybody enjoyed last week's episode on the topic of cognitive biases, in which we spoke with Dr. Joshua Daly of the University of Arkansas. For those of you with an interest in this important topic, I'd certainly recommend you take a listen to last week's episode. As I say most weeks, if you'd like to get in touch with me, my email is easy to remember. It's pdheart at gmail.com. This week, we move on to the world of fetal cardiology, and the title of the work we'll be reviewing is Prenatal versus Postnatal Diagnosis of 22Q11.2 Deletion Syndrome, Cardiac and Non-Cardiac Outcomes Through One Year of Age. The first author of this work is Lindsay Freud, and the senior author, Donna McDonald McGlenn. And this work comes to us from multiple centers throughout the world. The first author of the work, who's the corresponding author, comes to us from the University of Toronto at Toronto Sick Kids Hospital. When we're done reviewing this paper, Dr. Freud has kindly agreed to speak with us about it. Therefore, let's move straight on to this article and then a conversation with its first author. This week's work is about chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome which is also known as DeGeorge syndrome or velocardiofacial syndrome or conotruncal anomaly face syndrome, and which I'll refer to as chromosome 22Q11 deletion syndrome in this description going forward. The authors explain the estimated prevalence being 1 per 2,148 live births or 1 per 1,000 to 1,500 in prenatal series. They explain how arch and conotruncal disease are common and also how non-cardiac anomalies like cleft lip or palip can also be seen. The authors also make reference to the now evolving availability of targeted so-called cell-free DNA screening for 22Q deletion syndrome, whereby from week 20 onward, pregnant women's blood can be tested for DNA that may be arising from the fetus and may indicate the presence of a genetic condition. Depending upon the disorder tested, the sensitivity, specificity, and negative and positive predictive value of this test can change, but it does offer a glimpse into diagnosis very early in pregnancy, and this is something we'll discuss with Dr. Freud a bit more during our conversation. The investigators explain that when this diagnosis of 22Q11 deletion syndrome is not made prenatally, postnatal testing might be prompted by dysmorphic features, organ anomalies, or the presence of severe combined immunodeficiency syndrome. They then explain how the large numbers of abnormalities seen in this condition requires a comprehensive and multidisciplinary approach to their care, and in particular, the cardiac diagnoses often require neonatal repair or intervention. However, non-cardiac complications like hypocalcemia or immunodeficiency or low platelet counts are similarly important to identify and manage. Finally, they mention how poor feeding and developmental delays can also plague the first year. With this as a background, the authors posit that prenatal detection of this condition can allow for a more comprehensive perinatal management of these children at birth at a tertiary center, and how this is likely to be associated with better newborn outcomes. However, the possible benefits of prenatal diagnosis of 22Q11 deletion syndrome has not been previously assessed, and so the goal of this work was to look across many different institutions and retrospectively compare both cardiac and non-cardiac outcomes among those diagnosed prenatally and postnatally up to one year of age. The authors described the details of this international multi-center retrospective study that included 30 sites across four continents from 2006 to 2019, and they explained that the patients were drawn mostly from the National Perinatal Research Consortium and or the International 22Q11.2 Deletion Syndrome Modifier Gene Consortium. They go into how the diagnosis of 22Q11 deletion syndrome was made and how they defined prenatally diagnosed and postnatally diagnosed, with postnatal patients being initially clinically diagnosed in the postnatal period and then confirmed with genetic testing before a year of age. They also go through their definitions for what is critical and non-critical disease, which was largely based on whether surgery was needed less than 30 days of age. They discuss their definitions for cardiac decompensation, what constituted a major infection, seizure diagnosis, and failure to thrive as well. They review their statistical analysis techniques, and for those interested, I would refer you to the paper, which will be referenced in the show notes. And on to the results! Well, in total, there were 625 patients in the 22Q11 deletion syndrome cohort, with 331, or 53%, being male. 
There were 259 that were prenatally diagnosed at a median gestational age of 21 weeks, with 101 elective terminations, or 39%, at a median of 22 weeks. Including two fetal demises, there were 156 live-born children, or 60% of those diagnosed prenatally. The postnatal cohort was 244 patients diagnosed at 28 days, with a range of 9 to 86 days. Thus, in total, the authors explain that the focus of this work was, in total, 522 patients with 278 prenatally diagnosed and 244 postnatally. They explain that the most common reason for genetic testing in the prenatal and postnatal life was detection of congenital heart disease. In prenatal life, other reasons for genetic testing accounting for 10% of the testing were things like absence of a thymus or renal anomalies. They mention that the cell-free DNA testing that we mentioned earlier demonstrated 37 patients, or 13%, with a high-risk result, of whom five had no echo or sonographic findings or family history. In postnatal life, the reasons for genetic testing other than congenital heart disease was dysmorphic features in 37%, non-cardiac anomalies in 14.5%, of which craniofacial or palatal ones were the most common, developmental delay, or an abnormal newborn screen for SCID. And how did these infants do in general? Well, first, 31 died in the first year of life, resulting in an all-cause mortality of 5.9% with a median age of death of 72 days. Importantly, there were no differences in mortality between the prenatally and postnatally diagnosed patient mortality rate. All but one of the deaths had congenital heart disease, and most, or 61%, had critical heart disease, with 70% dying from a cardiac cause, 25% or 5 patients dying of sepsis, and one dying of respiratory failure in the setting of immunodeficiency. Congenital heart disease was more common in the prenatally diagnosed group, with a hazard ratio of 4.2. When adjusting for the presence of critical congenital heart disease and gestational age at birth, the prenatal cohort was, first, less likely to deliver at a local community hospital, 5.1%, versus 38%, for an odds ratio of 0.11. They were also less likely to experience neonatal cardiac decompensation, 1.3%, versus 5%, for a similar odds ratio of 0.11. And finally, they were less likely to have failure to thrive by one year, 43% in the prenatally diagnosed cohort versus 50% in the postnatal cohort, for an odds ratio of 0.58. The authors also showed that the prenatally diagnosed cohort was less likely to have a delivery complication, with an odds ratio of 0.56. In their discussion, the authors state, and I quote, In the present study, prenatal versus postnatal diagnosis of 22Q deletion syndrome and perinatal and infant outcomes were assessed in a large cohort of live-born fetuses, neonates, and infants with confirmed deletion status. In both the prenatal and postnatal cohorts, the presence of critical congenital heart disease was the driver of both mortality and major morbidity by one year of age. Although there was no difference in survival based on time of diagnosis, prenatal detection yielded important benefits that may affect long-term outcomes of patients with 22Q deletion syndrome. Prenatal detection was associated with improved perinatal management and with more deliveries at a tertiary care center, fewer delivery complications, and less cardiac decompensation and need for mechanical ventilation in the neonatal period. Notably, Prenatal detection was also associated with less failure to thrive in infancy, which underscores the advantage of an earlier genetic diagnosis beyond the identification of congenital heart disease. The authors explain that prior works have shown that delivery of patients with critical congenital heart disease do better when delivered near tertiary centers, and also how prenatal diagnosis can result in better delivery room planning to optimize perinatal outcomes. They also mention how PGE was started earlier in the prenatally diagnosed patients possibly resulting in less organ dysfunction, and this has been shown in other works to be associated with less preoperative brain injury and generally better neurological development. They mention how hypocalcemia and associated seizures have been associated with worse intellectual disability in the 22Q11 deletion syndrome patient group, and how hemodynamic stability afforded by prenatal diagnosis may have important long-term effects. They re-emphasize how failure to thrive was a bit less common in the prenatally diagnosed patients, and how this may reflect less of what the authors term a diagnostic odyssey, allowing for earlier, more comprehensive multidisciplinary intervention for these complex patients.
they re-emphasize how despite prenatal diagnosis being associated with more critical congenital heart disease, the death rates were the same as well as major morbidity or length of stay between those who were prenatally and postnatally diagnosed, and wonder if the more serious heart disease in the prenatally diagnosed patients was offset in terms of risk for morbidity or mortality by the prenatal diagnosis and the ability to offset the risk of this serious disease with better planning. They make note that 85% of the patients with this deletion syndrome had developmental delays at one year of age, and how this information could be useful in counseling families of children with this condition. They review the cell-free DNA testing, and how this was done in a very small subcohort of this group, but how it will be potentially used in the future more commonly, and allow even earlier testing as it can be conducted even in the first trimester. They emphasize that any high-risk screen of the cell-free DNA testing would need to be confirmed with genetic confirmation, but also referral for a detailed OB ultrasound and fetal echo to screen for congenital heart disease. They explain that further studies will be needed to assess the performance, clinical utility, and cost-effectiveness of cell-free DNA testing for 22Q deletion syndromes. In regards to limitations, the authors explain how many different centers were included in different healthcare models and infrastructures and how this can complicate analysis of this data, and also how the study really focused on live-born fetuses without much detail of all cases with a prenatal diagnosis or suspicion for this deletion syndrome, and how that changed perinatal management, and also how early miscarriages or elective terminations may not have been referred to this group. The authors also mention how long-term neurodevelopmental cognitive and psychiatric assessment in this cohort will be needed. And so they conclude, prenatal detection of 22Q deletion syndrome was associated with improved delivery management and less cardiac and non-cardiac morbidity, but not mortality in comparison with postnatal detection. Well, this is an interesting work, once more showing the benefit of prenatal diagnosis of patients with congenital heart disease. Though the mortality rates may not have been better, it's noteworthy that the outcomes were similar between prenatal and postnatally diagnosed patients, despite the fact that the prenatally diagnosed generally had more complex heart disease, perhaps suggesting that knowing about the diseases in advance allowed for improved outcomes similar to those who had less serious congenital heart disease. I'd be interested to hear a bit more about cell-free DNA testing and how available and accurate it is, And I would certainly second Dr. Freud and colleagues' statement that following these patients' neurocognitive outcomes will be of interest to see if the hypothesis that more stable pre- and post-operative courses is associated with better neurological outcomes. In the interest of time, I think we'll move forward to our conversation with the work's first author, Dr. Freud. Joining us now to discuss this week's work is Dr. Lindsay Freud. Dr. Freud is the Section Head of Fetal Cardiology and Associate Professor of Pediatrics at the University of Toronto. Dr. Freud comes from Chicago and obtained her undergraduate degree from Duke University and medical degree from Harvard Medical School. She completed pediatrics residency at Boston Children's Hospital, followed by pediatric cardiology fellowship at Lurie Children's Hospital at Northwestern. Following this, she went on to complete an advanced imaging fellowship at Boston Children's Hospital. It is a delight to have her join us to discuss this week's work. Welcome, Dr. Freud, to the podcast. I'm here now with Dr. Lindsay Freud. Dr. Freud, thank you so much for joining us this week on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Real pleasure. Uh, Very much enjoyed your work, which seemed like it took an awful lot of uh, work with so many different centers involved. So congratulations to you and all of your many, many co-investigators. One of the interesting concepts that you talk about in your work, it's a topic that comes up in the beginning and in the discussion, is the idea of cell-free DNA screening for prenatal detection of 22Q deletion syndrome patients. Um, This might be something very obvious and uh, known to you in the world of fetal cardiology, but um, a lot of people who listen aren't fetal cardiologists, and I'm wondering if you could explain what exactly that technique is, uh, what are the potential advantages as well as the disadvantages of this approach, and whether you feel uh, it should be routinely offered to parents when there is clinical concern for this diagnosis of 22Q deletion syndrome? Yeah, that's a a great question. Um, Before I delve into expanding upon my answer to that question, I also just want to acknowledge that, um, as you mentioned, this work was a really, really huge effort amongst lots of different specialists as well as centers. We had over 
30 sites on four continents and people from different backgrounds, from genetics to pediatric cardiology um, to maternal fetal medicine. So I just want to thank all of my colleagues for their incredible efforts to, to pull together this cohort. Yes. Um, in terms of, I think that's a great question, what is cell-free fetal DNA? Because in, in my world, we talk about it all the time, but it may not be familiar to everybody. So essentially, we all have small pieces of our DNA that circulate in our bloodstream that are not within cells for normal reasons, cell turnover, et cetera. And it turns out that in pregnant patients, if you take a blood sample, most of the DNA fragments that you find would be from the mom, but there would also be a fraction that are representative of the DNA in the fetus and the placenta. Hmm. So that was actually discovered back in the late 1990s. And the past decade or longer has really seen an explosion of the ability to find the fetal DNA circulating in the maternal bloodstream, use next generation sequencing to rapidly expand upon it, and diagnose really conditions that can range from common aneuploidies to now what people are talking about in terms of single gene disorders, even in, in certain cases. So... It's become very, very good at detecting the common aneuploidies. And in fact, it's now recommended to be offered to all pregnant women in the United States as a way for screening for the common aneuploidies. There's also this increased effort at using the same technology to look for common microdeletion and duplication syndromes. And it turns out that 22Q11.2, as we all know as pediatric cardiologists, which is highly associated with congenital heart disease, is also the most common microdeletion syndrome. So it happens in about one out of every 1,500 pregnancies. Yes. And so there is discussion about as this technology advances, should we be offering universal screening for 22Q as well? The other point that I just want to make is that um, it's a little bit of a misnomer. So cell-free fetal DNA testing is also called NIPT or non-invasive prenatal testing, but it's a a bit of a misnomer because it's not a test. It's actually a screen. Hmm. So just like serum analytes, nuchal translucency, all of those things, it's a screen. It's our best guess, but it's not a definitive diagnostic test. I see. I see. Um, interesting. And right now, Lindsay, this test is, is it available in most centers in the U S, um, as a, uh, screening tool? Yeah. So it is available in the United States, but it has variable insurance coverage, um, depending on, you know, what state you live in, who your insurance carrier is in the absence of fetal anomalies, it's not uniformly covered. Now I, of course, practice in Canada, at sick kids where the landscape is a bit different yes and here in canada it's offered to women um if they are over 40 um and in the context of fetal anomalies but really in the context of anomalies we really would encourage them to have diagnostic testing which would be with an amniocentesis to actually get the fetal specimen itself and for that, analysis. And that would obviously be far more accurate and diagnostic. That's diagnostic. Yeah. That's yeah. right. Uh, well, uh, thank you. That was really uh, very interesting. Um, and I'm guessing for different disorders, the benefit of this screening test is better or worse, depending on what you're screening for, I guess. That's right. And the other point um, about where the technology is right now is that it's very good for trisomy 21. It's pretty good for trisomy 18 trisomy 13 and monosomy X or Turner syndrome. And it's just really entering, I think, a sphere of real clinical utility for microdeletions. So positive predictive values are about 50% with the last most updated algorithms, which means that there is still an important false positive um, prevalence of the test that really needs to be communicated carefully to families. Yes, I would imagine so. You know, Lindsay, as a highly experienced fetal cardiologist, uh, 
I'm wondering if you might be able to give the audience a ballpark idea of, in your experience, how many families choose to terminate pregnancy when they are faced with this diagnosis of 22Q deletion syndrome. Um, in your work, I think you talk about something like 39% of the patients uh, had a termination, but do you have any sense what percentage of the patients who were determined prenatally to have the diagnosis actually chose to terminate and never even made it into your study in the first place? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And I'm, I'm really pleased that you asked that because we're actually, we presented um, some data at the International Society of Prenatal Diagnosis meeting last year and are working on uh, a follow-up study that's actually honing in on understanding how this affects pregnancy decision-making. And like you said, in our cohort, we had just shy of 40% that terminated. And we've tried to understand a little bit more what that landscape looks like. And one thing, of course, which is not surprising, is that it's highly variable depending on what country you're from. So we saw termination rates that ranged from 10% to 80% based on where the pregnant patient was living. We um, also saw what was really interesting was that the prenatal diagnosis of 22Q has been increasing every year over the study duration, which was over 11 years. But despite increasing prenatal diagnosis, there was no increasing rate in termination of pregnancy, which was really interesting. Yeah. And the last piece that I'll mention that I'll mention is that the presence in our cohort in those that were terminated, which are not included in the present paper, in that cohort, the presence of a cardiac anomaly um, did not influence the decision to continue or terminate. However, that was mediated by counseling by a pediatric cardiologist. And in those situations where there was counseling by a pediatric cardiologist, pregnancies were more likely to be continued, which I think is really, really interesting. Interesting, huh. Uh, that's so. That's very interesting. So, in other words, uh, when a pediatric cardiologist uh, lays out the groundwork and the diagnosis to a family, they are in fact less likely to terminate. Uh, is what you're saying? Wow, right. very, very interesting. I, yeah. Not sure. I not sure. I would have imagined. I would have imagined if someone asked me to guess, I would have guessed the opposite. Actually, um, but uh, that's very interesting. It just shows you why. Why sometimes um, doing the actual study is better than just guessing what the answers would be. Right. I think I think it also underscores why multidisciplinary prenatal counseling is so important because my hypothesis is that the pediatric cardiologist or fetal cardiologist really focuses on the cardiac morbidity and mortality. But of course, 22Q is a syndrome that affects every organ in the body. Mm-hmm. And um, I would guess that a uh, maternal fetal medicine specialist or geneticist or genetic counselor might go into greater detail about some of those non-cardiac issues, particularly when it comes to neurodevelopment and risk for psychiatric disease. I see. I'm wondering if you could explain to the audience, in the discussion, you talk about the fact that there were some differences in regards to survival for 20Q deletion syndrome between U.S. and non-U.S. sites um, I, you know, I have to be honest, I read through the paper reasonably fast. I'm not sure I saw what that difference was. I thought maybe you could share that with us and and then maybe comment on why you think these differences uh, exist. Yeah, great question. So, you know, one of the central questions of the paper was what is the advantage of prenatally diagnosing 22Q? So as we enter this era where we may see that self-refetal DNA screening transforms the landscape of who gets the diagnosis, we're trying to figure out essentially what advantages it confers, if any, to having a prenatal diagnosis. And so when we got to the multivariable analysis, we knew, first of all, prior to arriving at our multivariable analysis, that the presence of and severity of congenital heart disease was the major driver of morbidity and mortality in this population. Not terribly surprising. So we obviously put that in the model and we put time of diagnosis in the model. In the model, we then added additional variables that are commonly adjusted for in our congenital heart disease and congenital heart surgery population. So those are things like gestational age at birth and site. Now we had 30 sites 
with really variable surgical volumes Mm -hmm. and huge differences also in mortality. And so it wasn't going to be feasible or even statistically possible to adjust well for all these different 30 sites. So we kind of just sort of split the difference and adjusted for site by doing U.S versus non-US, which was about 50-50 of the cohort. Mm -hmm. Now, to our surprise, we weren't necessarily expecting that adjustment to be a statistically significant variable in and of itself, but it was, um, in that the US patients had slightly decreased mortality. Overall, however, mortality was pretty low in the cohort. It was just slightly less than 6%. Mm -hmm. So we're just talking about one to two percentages different between U.S. and non-U.S. sites. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a lot of potential explanations for it. I think systems of care are very different. I think um, termination rates are higher overall outside the U.S., which may mean that non-U.S. centers have less experience um, managing these patients and their comorbidities, because there was also a difference in terms of the incidence of comorbidities between U.S. and non-U.S. sites in, ad- in addition to mortality. Um, but I think it's an area that's really interesting and, and deserves further exploration. Yeah, yeah, no question. Uh, very interesting. Thank you. You know, uh, Lindsay, in your discussion, you mentioned that delivery closer to a cardiac surgical center is associated in most studies with decreased neonatal mortality for congenital heart patients. In your work, the prenatal diagnosis uh, was not actually associated with a mortality difference, with the major caveat, of course, being that the patients who were prenatally diagnosed had much more serious heart disease, and so one could make a very strong argument, I think, that actually you did have an impact. Um, But do you have any thoughts on why... uh, why the team wasn't able to show like a more obvious difference in mortality? Or do you think that um, maybe just the mere fact that the prenatally diagnosed, more seriously affected patients had a similar survival was in and of itself proof that the uh, neonatal or prenatal diagnosis was important? I love that you mentioned that because I wrote about that in the discussion. You know, it's one of the challenges of proving that prenatal diagnosis changes outcomes for our congenital heart disease population is partly what you mentioned, which is that we, as fetal cardiologists, see a much more severe spectrum and severe phenotype congenital heart disease. And the other thing about our field, which is pretty remarkable, is that mortality rates are overall pretty low. So it's hard statistically sometimes to see the differences when it comes to mortality. Yeah. I don't think any of our group was surprised that there was no mortality benefit. Um, But what is really important to think about and where I think a lot of our field is moving towards in terms of looking at the benefits of prenatal diagnosis is looking how did that transition from the fetus to the neonate go? How stable was the baby? Were they in a good place? preoperatively so that our surgeons could do the best job possible. And of course, all of these things become important when we think about long-term neurodevelopment. So ideally, if you're avoiding acute cardiac decompensation, mechanical ventilation, all of these things, then that is all going to lead to better brain perfusion Um, And especially in this kind of vulnerable population where we worry a lot about their long-term neurocognitive outcomes and risk for psychiatric disease, producing the most stable baby one can arrive at would certainly be just helping that baby ideally in the long run. I think, and so that was really the most important finding from our paper was that we, these, these, these babies were more stable. Um, and then the, the other important point was that it wasn't just that they were more stable neonates. It was that actually when you looked out to one year, which is why we included follow-up to one year, they had other, the prenatally diagnosed patients with 22Q had some other better outcomes. They had less failure to thrive. And there was also a suggestion that they had less developmental delay, although it wasn't statistically significant. And what I think that speaks to is that when we know the diagnosis earlier, then we are aware of all the possible issues and complications. And so we involve all of our pediatric subspecialty colleagues Mm 
to work with these patients as best as possible perioperatively, as an outpatient, to really maximize their feeding, their growth, their development, knowing exactly what children at 22Q are at risk for. All very good points. Well, for those in the audience, as is often the case when we bring big-time superstars into our podcast, we're having this interview very late at night on a weeknight, and uh, Dr. Freud is, I'm sure, exhausted because I understand she just finished doing a TE on a late patient. So I'm going to wrap it up pretty much following the same uh, line that you were just discussing. So you were implying that maybe the neurocognitive and other outcomes would be better presumably because they were much more stable and also all of the varied issues that affect these patients may be addressed a little earlier in life uh, because, as they say, knowledge is power. Are you planning with your co-investigators to possibly continue to follow these patients to sort of see if your uh, theory is, is held out that uh, over time these patients actually do have improvement in neurodevelopmental outcomes and psychiatric outcomes and, and the such? Yeah, we would love to be able to do that. We were funded um, by our study. We received a grant from the International 22Q Foundation. And so it was a mammoth effort with funding. But certainly, um, should we be fortunate enough to receive funding again in the future, I think that to be able to follow this cohort longitudinally, because it is the biggest perineal cohort that's been amassed to date of 22Q that to be able to follow these patients longitudinally, look at their developmental outcomes um, and eventually their mental health outcomes as they become even older, that would be very, very valuable information. So I would love for that to occur. I think uh, truer words have not been spoken on the podcast. Well, uh, Dr. Freud, thank you very much for joining us this week. And once again, Let me congratulate you and all your many, many co-investigators, one of which is here at my own center, Mount Sinai. And so uh, congratulations. And once again, thank you so much. Thank you again for having me. Great pleasure. Well, once again, Dr. Freud proved the podcast adage that if the guest is good, there's little to add. She's obviously an uncommonly clear speaker. And I'm sure that those of you both in fetal cardiology and those not in the field found much of interest in her many comments. I'd like to thank her once more for speaking with us late one evening this week about this interesting work. At this point, before we go to the very end of the podcast and the music, I wanted to take a moment, as I have the past few years, to mention my own center's very prominent and famous non-invasive imaging course that's been going on here at Mount Sinai in New York City for the past 14 years. This year's conference is entitled Conversations in Care, the Single Ventricle and is coming on May 4th, which is a Saturday, and is taking place, as all the prior ones have, here at Mount Sinai in New York City. And the speakers are a who's who of some of the great imagers and other types of providers in our field of cardiovascular medicine. And I can tell you as a native New Yorker that May is certainly one of the very best months to visit our fair city. However, rather than have me speak about this wonderful event, I've invited some of the course directors to join me now and briefly chat about the meeting, so let's bring them on right now. Okay, I'm here now with the faculty, actually the course directors of this wonderful Mount Sinai Imaging course. I'm here with uh, Dr. David Ezon, Dr. Jennifer Cohn, Dr. Kenan Stern, and Ms. Jen Yao. Missing today, unfortunately, are Aaron Paul, who's also a co-director, is the director of echocardiography at Goriab Children's Hospital in Morristown, New Jersey, and of course, our own Rosalie Castaldo, who's out today, but I know wishes she were here. So welcome, all of you. Uh, Dave, maybe you could uh, kick us off here and just uh, tell us a little bit about this conference and what makes it a little different from some other conferences. Thanks, Rob. Uh, this is really a unique conference. It's uh, Instead of the, the usual, typical, boring PowerPoints, we have five exciting conversations between multidisciplinary experts right in front of the audience live, where they ask each other questions, teach each other, and teach the audience about different aspects of cardiac imaging and the care of persons with congenital heart disease. Hmm, interesting. So PowerPoints are out, huh? Pretty much. You get some visuals uh, to help guide us, uh, but it's really about teaching each other and, and a lot of practical tips how to, how to care for these patients. Sounds interesting. Well, uh, you know, this is exciting in that we have echo technologists and sonographers coming. Jen, obviously one of the preeminent sonographers in the United States and in the world. Uh, as a sonographer, what do you... Uh, 
What do you think sonographers should be looking forward to? What what should they? What do you think they're going to gain from the experience of coming to this class, to this course? Thanks, Rob. So I think um, the sonographers, um, it will be a um, besides their session. Like the, for this conference, we have like special uh, session that we have a uh, few sonographers presenting, and for the sonographers to you know for other sonographers to attend, they can see. Oh, besides, um, you know, you can see. Oh. Um, even sonographers can participate in conferences and learning from the sonographers, not just for how to optimize scanning, but I think also um, attending the conference, listening to the other portion of the, uh, you know, with the surgeons and the fellows, so you can learn a lot from the clinical perspective besides yeah. the echo scanning. Yeah, I, I would think that would be a very important part of it because... Uh, you guys are always providing such a critical piece of information in all our patients, but maybe sometimes you don't see the, you know, how it fits into the major, larger puzzle of the patient. So I, I think yes. if I were a sonographer, I think that would yes. be, is that, is that something you think people will enjoy? Oh, yeah, definitely. And and then I think it will help um, on for that, you know, like learning, oh, this is like what the surgeon are interested in. And also will help the sonographers when they scan a complex case uh, to see a different perspective and get, better pictures. <laughs> Sounds great. Sounds really great. Um, well, we have here uh, also Dr. Jen Cohn and Dr. Ken and Stern, so I'm going to ask each of you the same question. Jen, uh, maybe you could highlight for the audience a, a session that you're particularly looking forward to amongst the, the few that uh, you as a co-director have arranged and organized. Sure. You know, as Dr. Izan said, this conference is really going from fetus to adults. Um, I'm particularly looking forward to the fetal session which talks about prenatal assessment of the single ventricle heart and going through some controversies and difficult cases there. Hmm. And we have some local colleagues. We have Dr. Lynn Simpson, who's MFM at Columbia, and we have Shane Morris, who's a very well-known fetal cardiologist at Texas Children, also participating in that session. Wow, wow, some real superstars listed there. And Kenan, uh, any particular session you're looking forward to? Um, I'm, of course, looking forward to all the sessions, but especially uh, especially yours, Dr. Pass. Uh-oh. Um, yep. <laughs> uh, so you and Dr. Nadine Schwader um, will be reviewing the uh, the pre glen and pre-Fontan evaluation uh, for, our, for these single ventricle patients and reviewing interventional versus non-interventional approaches. So that's always a, a fascinating topic to review. I'm looking forward to that. Mm, wow. Well, uh, of course, uh, I don't know that anyone's going to gain anything from my participation, but we all know that Dr. Schrader has a lot to say and uh, often learn a lot from her. Dave, uh, we're finishing up our little conversation. Anything else you wanted to uh, mention about the conference that you don't think we've covered well? I just want to say that uh, the best part of the conference is the attendees, uh, interacting with these experts that we're bringing together, asking questions, providing their own insight. So we're really excited to bring people from across the region and uh, across the country together to help care for persons with congenital heart disease. And I think it's important to remember this is going to be on May 4th, uh, which is a Saturday, and it's uh, this is just about the best time of the year to visit New York City. So for those of you interested in taking a trip to New York, I can't really think of a better time of the year when it's usually the weather is just right, not too hot, not too cold. Um, and, uh, and what's also nice, I think, is it's a one-day event, so people can come and make a whole weekend of it, which I think is a lot of fun. And uh, for those of you interested... In the show notes of this week's episode, there'll be a link to the to the meeting. It's very fairly priced, and I would certainly encourage those of you who are going to be in New York or interested in coming to New York to join us for this wonderful conference. Guys, thank you very much for joining me this week. To conclude this 292nd episode of PD Heart Pediatric Cardiology today, we hear the meltingly beautiful and very sad love duet that ends the final act of Puccini's opera La Rondine, which we've previously heard with different singers about three or four years ago. Today we hear the wonderful Chilean soprano Cristina Giardo Domas and the wonderful American tenor Jerry Hadley in a live performance in Germany nearly 30 years ago. Ms. Gallardo Domas is still singing today, and sadly Mr. Hadley was a victim of depression in 2007 at the age of 55. Thank you very much for joining the podcast this week, and thanks once more to Dr. Freud, I hope all have a good week ahead.